Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. It's time for us to go through the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. We're starting with the Nigerian Tribune, and uh, we'll get to share with you a couple of them. There are plots to incite war in the southeast, and that's from the Aboyan State Governor, Devo Mahi. Also, um, over 1.2 million children yet to be immunized in Nigeria, says UNICEF. Police storm forest in, in the search of kidnapped women in Oyo. And uh, Jusun vows to sustain strike until, until 36 states comply with financial autonomy. Buhari, APC's misrule, caused Twitter to choose Ghana over Nigeria. That's from the PDP. And also, 60 billion naira not printed to support March allocation. Federal government replies Obaseki. We can also find on the punch this morning, Makinde Akiri Dulu mourn as ex-Milad uh, Ahmed Usman dies at 70. And also, Jam lost over 10 million naira to fraudsters in 2020, says uh, the registrar. These are the big stories that we can find this morning on the Nigerian Tribune. So I've got the nation here. Uh, major headline, fire she, how uh, Southwest PDP Congress poll was rigged. Oh, he's not letting up on this. Well, we've got a couple of writers to this story. I'll just uh, reel them out. Ex-governor alleges violence, manipulation. Or your PDP, he should. Uh, that's, this is coming from uh, the PDP in your state now. Now, fire she should accept defeat. We also have this one. Obasaki's claim on revenue, debt, sad and untrue. Right? This is coming from the federal government. And um, we also have Lagos predicts 261 days of rainfall, uh, holding on to vehicles. My right, that is coming from Ajayi. And this is uh, Akiri Dulu he's talking to now. Uh, this is all happening in Undo State. Then we have this one here also. Southeast governor's alleged plot to incite a war in that region. You have to go to page four to find out details of that story. Uh, last but not least, Affair Babalola, let Supreme Court justices stay for life. That's interesting. Stay for life? For life. Mm. Mm. Well, okay. uh, I hope that, you know, as the talk, we'll be able to share his thoughts on that one. Let's uh, get to the punch newspapers next. Uh, states I thought you already face, did the punch. Uh, you already did the punch. No, I did the Tribune. Oh, okay. Uh, states face uh, cash crunch, salaries swallow revenues. Federal government seeks more funds. We need more money for debt servicing. A day-to-day -day running of, of uh, government admits the federal government. AKT spends 93% of allocation on workers, receives 3.1 billion naira on the average, says the state. And also this morning on the punch, Jusun strike, courts remain shot, National, National Assembly plans talks with governors. Uh, federal government approves 14.55 billion naira operational vehicles and boats for customs. And Lagos expects 261-day rainfall in 2021, says the government. We can also find on the pond this morning, the Vice President Toshimbajo criticizes vaccine politics, export ban on uh, developing countries. And federal government fortifies security at Abuja, Lagos and other airports. Senate alleges 7.6 billion naira secret withdrawal summons Ahmed and uh, AG. Those are the big ones on the punch this morning. So I've got the Guardian and it's packed. It looks loaded. The front page here. You see this picture, the major one, the only one actually, the Minister of Finance and uh, the Governor of Edo State side by side. And I think it's tied to the uh, whole thing about printing money. So you have this major headline, avoid reckless money printing to fund deficits, uh, expats won. And then we have also this one, red flags over AstraZeneca, uh, deal new blow to vaccination drive. Okay, uh, we have uh, this one here, over, two, tw over 20 Chibok parents died awaiting their girls. This is coming from the BBOG. Uh, we also have reps, speakers, beg governors to grant financial autonomy to judiciary and uh, legislature. Also, we have uh, 19 die in Gombe communal clash. That's a very sad one. All right. Uh, Mr. Yair, talk over to you now. Good morning once again. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, good morning. Really good to be here. And a special good morning to Vivian. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you. You've had enough of my good morning, so you don't need any more. Thank uh, you. Good morning. Papers, um, 
one or two seemingly minor things um, really stand out for me as far as I'm concerned. And one of those is the, I don't want to call it feud, I don't know what to call it, between Governor Obaseki and the CBN governor, or not CBN, the Minister of Finance. Um, governor Obaseki is saying that so much money, about 60 billion, is being printed and then being used to augment what's going on in terms of sharing money to the states. And um, uh, the CBA Minister of Finance is saying that that's not true. Uh, two things stand out for me. I, I listen to the, the tape very well, and um, I listen particularly to the context within which he was saying. Uh, he was not really so much about the fact that um, things are going south at the national, but the fact that within the state, they ought to be able to brace up themselves for what is coming. And it's so easy to see what is coming. How does Nigeria make the money? Basically, two areas. One is uh, resources from oil, which is the main thing. And then the second one is um, internally generated revenue. We all know that internally generated revenue is dwindling. It's no rocket science. And it's so easy to know why, to understand why, because you get revenues when people are being well paid and either the direct payers you go stuff uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the personal tax in, uh, that, that's paid or the profits uh, that the, the companies make that is being taxed. When companies are not operating, where are you going to get the taxes from? And when the people are being laid off, where are you going to get the income tax from? These are no rocket science. And he's saying, look, if we are going to be sustainable as a state, we need to start to look beyond this uh, feeding bottle approach to governance every month we go to Abuja. And I really love that because that should be the conversation amongst all governors at this point in time. And I think that the electorate, we need to sit up and realize that this issue of how much money does he have, how much money does he have, is no longer what should run our election. What should run our election should be how resourceful is this person? Does he have the mental capacity? Does he have the heart for governance? Does he understand governance, what it is and what is expected of a governor? I think the time has come when we as citizens need to start a major enlightenment campaign of the citizens on what government and governance is all about. I think it's a major tragedy that is coming and we need to sit up. So I want to say that two things have come to me on that. Number one is that if the federal government was thinking that as much as thinking, they know that the cat has been let out of the bag. And if they've been doing that, instead of um, thinking of how to cover it, it doesn't really make sense. If anything, they should come clean with the plan and say, look, times are hard. Like all these people wanting to go on strike, they need more money. That's because the federal government is still having this body language of, oh, no problem, no problem. But if Mr. President comes clean with us and addresses us, he says, oh, don't, don't let people make the party feel bad. All this issue of leaving politics or leaving governance and concentrating on politics is running this country aground. And I think the time has come for you and I, forget this ruling government, to sit right. up and start to enlighten our people on what government is all about. Well, the government, the the government says... Uh, the government says, you know, they didn't print any money. Um, but, of course, it, you know, the conversation is also very important uh, at a time I'm like not this. Really I'm um, really not interested in all those things. I'm yeah. not really not interested. I want them to tell Let's, me. Uh, Don't tell me you're not printing money. Tell me how you are coping with the situation and what the facts are. Absolutely. Let, let's move to um, uh, two other you know, issues. Uh, well, one other issue now, and that is the former governor of Ekiti State, Ayodili Fire, she is saying that the... Uh, Southwest PDP Congress was rigged. Uh, this is a couple of days after the uh, Congress was held and uh, Arapaja, Taufik Arapaja was declared winner. After uh, Fire Shea had also congratulated uh, Shea Makinde and the winner, and of course uh, declared Shea Makinde the leader of the Southwest uh, PDP. Um, what, what do you think may have changed? Yeah, I, I listened to him again and um Two things also jumped out at me. 
The first is that what he said about the Congress is being rigged. I don't know why we should find that as news. It's like, wow, is that, that's, that's, that's a, the stocking thread of the two parties. They, they either rig it directly or they employ thugs to scatter it. The thing is not going their way. So this is no news. But for me, what made news, and I actually took time to listen to him, and I really gave him a lot of um, respect, I would say so. Um, the first is that, you know, you know he, he was saying that he stood as a one-man riot squad against several governors, against several uh, deputy governors, past and present, against the National Assembly members, senators, and everything. And yet, out of a total vote of over 900 or 900 or thereabout, he only lost by 13 votes. And for me, that was, wow, forget it. I understand politics. I've been in the PDP at the, one of the highest levels you could imagine in the PDP before I left and become non-partisan, so to speak. You know, So I know how these things are. And for him to have achieved that feat, it means that if there was a level playing ground, bros, that guy for king. Yeah, but I it's still the uh, PDP should hold him here. So, but so it, it still doesn't. I find. Uh, I just want to no, share. No, you know, it still doesn't. Uh, you know, in any way, prove that it was rigged. Uh, you know, these are his allegations. And do you think it's also important no, that? No, what I'm saying is that rig. No, no. You see, rig, not rig, is really not the not the substance. It's not the it's not the story. Okay, the story is that. He was able to stand alone as a one-man riot squad and nearly upset the system, losing by only 13 votes. The second news is that that notwithstanding, he was able to put personal you know, um, hurts and, and, and grievances behind him and look at the larger interests of the party. And he kept saying, the party is bigger than my personal interest. So I have let go. I've congratulated them. We are not going to let this house that I built to fall and crash out. I, I think I think that's 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 magnanimous. That's well, it's not. This is so this is where I have a. Um, I'm, 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 this is where you know. I'm, I'm apologies for dragging this for so long. But is he really putting you know personal issues aside and you know as accepting that the party is bigger than his personal um, you know uh, wishes? If days after. The election has been held days after he, uh, a winner has been declared. Days after he claimed to be to have congratulated the winner, he goes on TV to say that it was rigged. And since then, they haven't called him. And since the election held, you know that nobody has reached out to him. It, it, isn't that still making it personal? Um, it is making it personal. Politics is personal, no matter how you look at it. Politics is personal interest. I've contested twice as a governorship candidate. So I can tell you that politics is personal. And he's coming out to let Nigerians know in all these things. I, Fayoshe, as a one man, I stood against the whole of the, 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 the machinery of government with all the commissioners, uh, sorry, all the governors and the assembly members and everything. So he's trying to tell Nigerians I am a force to reckon with come 2023. He, he's not going to keep quiet and just say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody will say, okay, he lost, he lost. No. The conversation now is, wow, you mean that guy was able to pull that sort of weight? You mean this guy is still that relevant? That's the politics aspect of it. He's a politician, so he's playing politics. You are doing cerebral analysis of the situation. He is doing politics. And this is exactly what he wanted. He needed people to talk, and people would start to bring up the fact that, you know, he lost only by 13 votes. And in fact, those 13 votes are only lost because of one, two, three. But that said, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. I've called them, I've congratulated them. And he also said publicly, I am not leaving this party. I think that he's a good politician. I, I, I would oh. concede that to him. Let's and, move on um, to other things. I wish that other politicians, when they play their politics, they will also, you know, end on a note of, let's move on. Yeah, sure. Let's move on, right? Let's do an about turn right now. So Babalola says that uh, Supreme Court justices to be allowed, they should be allowed to serve for life. What do you think about this? Um, you know, maybe for life, 
has a certain legal definition, understanding, ramification that I don't understand. Because I know that <laughs> there's an, a lady in my city, Nico de Quene, the wife of the first local government chairman in British West Africa. Okay? In fact, some people said British Africa. She is about 108 years. Okay? She is alive. I'm wondering if a Supreme Court judge or whatever is blessed with such long life, whether well, such a person will be allowed to be holding a walking stick and then going to sit. So for life, I don't understand what it means for life. Maybe there's a technical definition of for life, which means for as long as there's a level of um, sanity and capacity, okay? And then the question is, how do you establish that in a country like ours where the rule of law is not respected. You know, instead, it is concept of pre and the rest of, like, this is my person, let him be there for as long as he is there. I can always be seen as the brother, the uncle, the sister, the friend of the man in power. So I, I really don't want to go into that. But I think that um, for as long as they are cerebral, for as long as their faculties and senses uh, make them, their wealth of knowledge at that highest echelon of um, you know, legal um, um, expertise, we should use them. Because even this issue of retirement, my classmates, my classmates, I mean, <laughs> I know who I am, and my classmate just turned 60 and he's retired. And I'm just wondering how could, how could Tony leave office? It doesn't make sense. Because this guy is sharp. He has such wealth of knowledge and everything. So as much as possible, people are thinking, no. let them leave so that you know, opportunities can be created for other people to come in. But I'm asking yourself, can we start to run governance where the opportunities of employment is not in civil service? All right, let's, uh, in let's, the uh, organized private sector. let's uh, quickly talk about the um, statement by the PDP. It says, uh, Buhari and APC's misrule caused Twitter to choose Ghana over Nigeria. And that is coming from the PDP. There's also something on the Daily Independent uh, saying the federal government is mute over the president's return date from the UK. Two things. Number one, I agree with the PDP. Me and them, we don't always agree, but sometimes I agree with them. And I think that we really need to look at this concept of policy somersault. And we need to understand that the global, uh, the, 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 the global community operates on certain basic fundamentals, which is, you know, being able to sit down and analyze the situation and say, if I go to this country, what do I gain? What do I lose? It's true that Nigeria has um, a, a, an amazing market as far as Twitter is concerned, much, much better than that of Ghana. But the question is, if I go to Nigeria because of the market, now, what's their policies like? What's their capital repatriation policies like? What's their CPN policies like? Will I be able to get my money out? Will I have get in today and tomorrow there's a new policy that makes it difficult for me to operate? Or do I go close enough to them to a more stable, a more sane climb where I can still poach the market without the risk of my losing my business. These are the ways businessmen think, and these are business people. It's not sentiment, oh, we have the largest market, so you must come here. No. It's, it's like the oil, oil drilling companies. When the oil communities were becoming very, very restive, unfortunately, they now decided to go into deep sea, you know, deep sea, whatever, drilling, so they can still get their oil, but they get to come to your ground from far away, so they don't have to interface with you. These are the things that businessmen think, and that's the way it's going to be. If we want companies to start coming to Nigeria, we need to be very, very consistent and stable. You know, the central bank, the central bank, I don't know how I can say this enough. I really don't understand what is going on. Now, agriculture, the central bank is happening. Now there's a bank of agriculture. Small-scale industries, the central bank is happening. Now there is, uh, you know, the, uh, what's this other bank and all that is there. So the issue is, I really don't understand the role of the central bank, the role of the Minister of Finance, the role of other agencies. The time has come when we need to have a new set of people that come into government 
and leave this politics aside and face governance. All right. Go into what you call the best corporate practices. So the issue of Twitter, I really don't blame them. They are business people and they are smart. All they right. are doing uh, well. We'll have to wrap and up here. on your president. Okay, well, if you can squeeze president. that in in 30 seconds. Yes, Garuba Shehu told us that Mr. President was as fit as a fiddle. He was just going to have a little bit of medical tourism. Right now, there's a lot of very, very, very worrisome silence. Why is a man fit as a fiddle out when the country is burning from all sides? I think Mr. President should please come back home. We are, in fact, we are missing him. We are missing him. Please tell him we are missing him. Let him come back home. Wow. All right. As a can talk, thank you so much for your time and for speaking with us this morning. Always very interesting uh, listening to your take on these uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank All you, right. Vivian. Stay with us this morning. Uh, of course, uh, the 15th of April, we are going to be sharing with you next uh, the things that happened today many, many years ago. Um, it's uh, Today in History coming up next on The Breakfast. Yeah.